Hey, thanks for, for everybody uh, praying for me while I was gone. It seems here, I don't, you know, I don't know how much you want to hear about my own personal testimonies in life, but it seems like, I don't know, if, the, I have had more attacks of fear. Um, I just the devil. You know, I mean, in, in general, in life, I'm not a scaredy cat. And, uh, and so the devil tries to uh, get me, you know, he tries to talk me into not doing things and being intimidated about stuff, you know, and so hooking on to my camper and dragging them out to Pennsylvania, you know, by myself, nobody's around, you know, that's a little bit intimidating. And, um, he turned my mic down just a little bit. I know you're working it won't work. It's not flying. <laughs> Here, come and get this one. Uh, and so I was thinking about sharing that, you know, that how brave of a guy I was, how much faith I had to go out there and do that, you know. And I thought of Ellis, you know, like Ellis never had anybody, you know, holding his hand whenever he's driving that truck and trailer all over the place. Like, <laughs> he's probably sitting back there going, Come on, you need me to hold your hand. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and just things, you know, uh, if Karen sneezes, then the devil jumps on me and, oh, she's going to, you know, and you have to stand, you have to fight against that. You have to stand against that. Uh, it's happened so many times over the years that... And maybe, well, I'll just say that, you know, when, uh, that I'll be getting ready to go somewhere on a trip or do something. I know the Lord is in this and the devil says, You're, yeah, not going to make it and, and tries to scare me off. And, uh, you know, and, I, and it just seems like here lately he's been busier at that, but you still have to stand against it. You have to speak the word and, um, so, Hey, let's, uh, uh, let's say I walk by faith, not by sight. Second, oh wait, did I finish these? Oh no, I didn't. So <laughs> we can come back and say that. I actually slept last night. I don't know if you if you think what's the matter with him? He didn't get any sleep last night. Well, I slept great. In fact, I think. Well, anyway, you don't want to care. Uh, so you can see her sign up thing. You know where where you sign up. And hey, so also. It's uh, the Lord is dealing with us about praying more, uh, especially, you know, praying for the election. But he put it in my heart that there are some things that uh, his assignment he's given us as believers and as faith, as faith fellowship. You know, he's got the stuff for us to accomplish. And if we don't pray, it won't be accomplished. And uh, I just, am I the only one that feels like time is short? You know, if you're going to get Uncle Sam saved, you better get busy. If you're going to witness to Uncle Sam, you better get busy because the days are, time is short. And so we're, there, we're going to be, we're going to have more times of prayer. And, uh, and so we're, cha we're moving. We've been praying on Wednesday afternoon at, uh, at 3.30, I think. Is that what it was? 2.30. But next Saturday, we're going to pray at 8 a.m. 8 a.m. So you should be able to get in here. Usually we're in and out in an hour, unless the Holy Ghost moves, in which case we don't give a rip. You know what I'm saying? It doesn't matter what kind of picnic you had planned for Saturday afternoon if the Holy Ghost is moving, then that's, what, that's the most important thing in the universe, right? And so, uh, but you can be here eight to nine, and then you can go about the stuff that you had to do. Now, I know that means you have to get a ticket. You may, you may have to shower. <laughs> but really, we won't be so close that we're sniffing on you. So, so even if you want to get up, and, and running here without taking a shower first will be all right. Now we, and that, this is not set in stone. Like this is not a permanent every Saturday morning of the world, but this coming Saturday for sure, 8 a.m. And uh, it's, it's, not, it's not a social time. It's not coffee and donuts. There, I may have a Bible lesson about prayer. I'm not sure if I will or not. Because he's been putting some things in my heart about prayer, and I'm wondering if, I, if that's for me or if I'm supposed to be teaching that. So we'll find out. 
But so that's uh, this coming Saturday, which means probably Wednesday we won't be praying. We'll, we'll hold off till Saturday. So this coming Saturday to eight, and we'll see how we'll get a feel for who makes it and who doesn't make it. And uh, if you don't come, we'll find your time. <laughs> Hear me, Leon? Yeah, we'll find, we'll find your time. So, um, okay. So now I think I'm through all that. Is there anything else I needed to, feels weird to not have a bulletin. We have a, t- I know I ran away last week and left this in the middle of a technology a technology <laughs> turmoil. The internet was down uh, and we got part of it back up. And of course, Mediacom says, it's not my fault. <laughs> they may be right. And so, cause this is the dinner, the devil attacks you and stuff wears out. And so uh, hopefully through the course of this week, we'll get stuff back easier and more functional. Okay. Hey, so I walk by faith, not by sight. Second Corinthians five, seven and faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Romans 10, 17, God is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should repent. Has he said and will he not do it? Has he spoken? Will he not make it good? Numbers 23, 19. So say, this is my Bible. I have what it says I have. I can do what it says I can do. I believe it because I'm a believer. I don't doubt it because I am not a doubter. Come on. I am not a doubter. I'll say it again. I am not a doubter. (laughs) Hallelujah. Let's pray. And uh, we're glad to be here. We we love the folks that we see here. And it's fun to be here. But mostly we're here to meet you. That's the first reason. That's the most important thing. We're here to be. as we worship and as we give and as we uh, hear the word taught, we believe that your Holy Spirit is a revealer of truth. That's what Jesus said. That he would guide us into truth. And so, this is a Holy Ghost service because we're expecting your Holy Spirit to reveal truth to us. Even in, in areas where we think we've heard it already, we think we've heard it all before. Our ears are open to hear. Jesus said, whoever has ears to hear, let him hear. So we are here to hear. And, and not just to learn, but to be transformed. Because we believe that the word changes us. The word renews our minds. And we're transformed uh, from the inside out by the work of your Holy Spirit. For your glory, in Jesus' name, amen. Here lately, I've uh, several of my friends and folks I've listened to have um, warned people, and it's not a new thing, to be careful about saying, "Oh, I heard that already." Oh, I know that already. I've d- I've done it. I've. I've gone to meetings where uh, I knew people had really powerful teachings that I, I, needed, I wanted to hear. And they, they said, well, the Lord told me to talk about this. And, and they started talking about stuff that I think, I've heard a million sermons on that. And so if we're not careful, when we say, oh, I heard that already. I got three pages of notes on that already. Then... That hinders the part where Jesus says, him that hath ears to hear, let him hear. And it's what's particularly easy when you hear someone teaching on something and you would say, oh, I heard that already. You're listening to me, I can tell. I heard that already. If you're not careful, what you'll hear is what you already know. I bet he's going to say this. I bet that, now this point leads to that point. I bet. And so saying, I heard that already, is, can hinder hearing the new thing, the next thing. And we all know that the Bible is so rich and, and, and deep and the power of the Holy Spirit so profound that the same sermon that you meditate on every day for a year, you can hear something new about 
from that verse, from that verse, you can hear something new on the last day of the year compared to the first day of the year. Just, you know, it's just, it's a miracle. It's a, it's a miraculous, wonderful power of the Holy Spirit. So, you know, when, when all of this world went kind of crazy with, um, you name it, right? And there were people who would uh, consider themselves prophetic, prophetically gifted. Some would even call themselves prophets. There was conflicting words, messages going forth. Some people were prophesying that this is the word of the Lord, that uh, God is going to defeat this whole, you know, COVID-19 thing, and, and uh, he's going to get the glory, and this is going to go back, we'll be healthier in the end than we were in the beginning. Now, somebody else ha- had a prophetic word that this is going to lead to disaster, that, you know, most of the world is going to die. Well, okay, not exactly, you know that uh, the political, there will be political upheaval in our nation and other nations. And, and so on the one hand, you had prophetic messages going out saying, saying, oh, it's going to be wonderful. It's going to be marvelous. This is, woohoo, we're going to give God the glory. And then somebody else is saying, oh, you better be stocked, put, you know, get three freezers and full, full of stuff and <clears throat> sell, you know, sell your mini bike and, and take that money and put it in ammunition or, or gold bullion or some kind of, you know, b- prepare was the word, prepare, get ready. Hunker down, hunker down. Well, to some extent, you know, we're glad to have people who prophesy things and and speak things. And and, um, we have to be careful because the Bible verse says, tells us directly not to look down on prophecies and prophets. Yeah. To the Thessalonican church, Paul said, not to despise prophesying. Well, why would anybody, why would you despise a prophet? Well, I'll tell you why. Because you heard three times you heard a prophet say this and didn't come to pass. Three times you heard, or ten times or a thousand times you heard prophets say, oh, this is the word of the Lord. And you're going, that even, even the Bible tells you that ain't so. <laughs> so you can, if you're not careful, if you don't guard your heart, you can be, start looking down when somebody stands up and says, now this is the word of the Lord. You're going, yeah, right. <laughs> oh, I got a Facebook message. <laughs> you know, because you just turn it off. Okay, that's what it means to despise means you don't, you don't put any value in it. So we are specifically warned not to devalue prophetic words because it can be so powerful and in your heart you should know what's true and what's not true. But so what came into my heart is that we need to talk about uh, whatever happens, our God's a big God. He, he, the promise that he gave me will sustain me in good times and bad. In, in fact, Sometimes the problems in good times are worse than the problems in the bad times. Sometimes prosperity is a more powerful temptation to get somebody off track. Hello? Hello? Come on. If you, if somebody, you know, somebody hand, somebody handed Leon, I'm like, why am I picking on Leon today? This is pick on Leon Sunday. I'm doing my best to walk out of the camera frame too. I don't know if Kathy's like, yeah, am I? Yeah, yeah. So somebody, somebody handed Leon a, t- a lottery ticket and turned out he won $100 million. Well, that would look pros- prosperous. You know, 100, 100 million? You know, what if you pay half of that away in taxes? You still got 50 million? I mean, I think 50 million buys new trucks, new boats, new campers, new um, motorcycles, and, and uh, you know, a list of stuff. You know what I'm saying? I uh, put, 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 put money in a CD or some kind of investment plan and he didn't have to work anymore. And he doesn't go to church. He's not on his knees every night praying for, you know what I mean? Sometimes prosperity is a worse temptation. It's a worse trial than having everything taken away and, and hitting your knees every night and trusting the Lord and seeing miracle after miracle after miracle. That's what happened to the, happened to the children of Israel. When, when, uh, when the children of Israel were in bondage in Egypt, they, they started out, in the, well, you know, their, their Egyptian vacation <laughs> started out good. E- Egypt was the place that had plenty of food, plenty of, plenty of everything, and they had the land of Goshen, you know, and, and it was somebody in their family. It was, it was somebody in their family running stuff. How good is that? That's nice. And so in the beginning it was good, but they became in bondage and in slavery. And so they cried out. They cried out to the Lord, and he rescued them by the hand of Moses. Now, if... If I would have been Egyptian, excuse me, if I would have been an Israeli in Egypt, I might have 
hoped for Moses to produce a military coup against Pharaoh because, you know, he was raised, Moses was raised in Pharaoh's house. Who knows all the political contacts and, and uh, maneuver that he could have done? Wouldn't it have been great? So one day I'm a slave, and the next day Moses is in charge. I mean, well, you saw him kill. He killed that Egyptian guy because the Egyptian guy was beating up the uh, Jewish guy. So he kills him right there. I mean, that's kind of, you know, wouldn't that have been fun? But when Moses came, when Moses came to deliver the Jews out of Egypt, he took him to the wilderness. Well, there's not food. There's not water. Sometimes God answers your prayers not like what you thought. But it's not less. It was God's plan to take him to the promised land, going clear back to Abraham. Remember? It wasn't God's plan for them to rule Egypt. It was God's plan for them to have their own land. And they would have got there a lot faster if they would have trusted him. Am I right? Now, does this apply to you? It might. You have, there's something bugging you in your life, something that's a trial, something that's a thorn in your flesh. There's some good Bible, Bible imagery. And you're crying out to God. You think he hears you? Well, of course he hears you. You think he loves you? Of course he loves you. Think he's going to answer your prayer? He will if you trust him. <laughs> but the answer may not look like what you wanted because you really what you wanted to do is rule Egypt. Man, that's good preaching, really. That should be a book. I should really. I didn't, this is not my sermon, by the way. My prayer was to rule Egypt. But instead, God took me to the promised land. Well, that was quite a journey. It took generations to get there. But God's plan is bigger and greater and more wonderful and awesome than our plan. And even in the wilderness, he provided miracle food, miracle water. It says he provided miracle clothes. I mean, it mentions, it talks about the, clothes, the fact that their clothes, that their shoes did not, 40 years their shoes did not wear out. Now they were the most uncomfortable things. No, 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 no. No, if God gives you miracles, shoes are awesome. Okay, so. <clears throat> so I felt like it was in my heart to make, to do my best to make sure that we are as ready as we can be for whatever happens. And so there's two, two uh, I, I saw this like, uh, like two legs, walking on two legs. One is uh, faith in the promises of God, and two, listening to the Holy Spirit. You can have a lot of faith. You can have a lot of the faith, but if you don't listen to the Holy Spirit and you do your own thing, you can't hear, you won't hear the Holy Spirit. You, you hinder your ability, ability to... Uh, receive the promise because you're, if God, <clears throat> if you know, if it's raining and you ask God for an umbrella, and and uh, so Jason's over there holding an umbrella, you still got to go stand under. You still get wet. You know what I'm saying? If He makes a way, you got to get where His way is, and, and you can see it in Scripture. <clears throat> okay, so now. It seems like more on Wednesday night, we've talked about the importance of walking in the spirit and on Sunday morning, we've talked about faith. And so this morning we're going to talk about faith. If you would turn into James chapter one, I don't know how long this will go. I, and I was tempted to preach on prayer this morning because I'm kind of revved up about the whole prayer that God's called to pray and, and the authority that he gives us to pray. And I'm, I'm studying it and, and I'm kind of fascinated by it. But here we are in James chapter 1 now. You know, James is the next book after Hebrews. I'm so glad you're here. <clears throat> this is so much more fun when you're here. Back when we were in here recording these things and nobody's here, you can do it. And if you watch them online and stuff, you probably even said, well, that's, pretty, that's good. That's, I appreciate that. You know, but it's not the same as being here. <laughs> See, this is watching services online is not the same as being here. And there's a bunch of people. <laughs> I'm talking to you who are happy to stay home 
and say, and, and there are even, come on, even politicians who are, I've seen it. You can have church on the internet. You don't have to go to that building. You don't, you know what? I can't lay hands on you. If you're not here. And, the, and uh, so there are between the, the devil doesn't want us to come here. You know this, right? The devil, the devil is full. He's got a full out assault on the church. He is desperate to stop the church because it's the church that's the body of Christ. Come on. It's the church that is the temple of the Holy Ghost. Read Corinthians, your body, the Holy Spirit lives in your body. It is the church who's in his way. If anything stops the devil, it's the church. It's the body of Christ. It was Jesus when he was here. And then when, after, when he left, he said, I'm okay. All the authority has been given to me. Boom. It's on you now. You guys get out there. And he gave us all kind of instructions about preaching the kingdom and laying hands on the sick and all the kind of, you know, all kinds of instructions. So there's a full out assault on the church. And uh, he wants desperately for us not to even be in communication with one another. And uh, so he would kill the internet if he could. In fact, that's kind of a thing I've wondered if his plan, you know, I don't prophesy for the devil and I'm not trying to give him any advice either. But if his, if his, if his plan was get everybody to abandon their church buildings and just try to have church online and then kill the internet. Now what? Now you're starting over. You know, who's got a garage? We can get together, you know, and uh, start having church in somebody's garage again kind of thing. So I don't know what his plans are, but I know that he's going to fail. He's not going to win. So anyway, so here we are. We're, uh, we're, t- <laughs> we're here to talk about walking in the promises of God. If you would turn to James chapter one, I think you're probably already there. Probably if anybody's not there, it's me. I'm going to start with verse one of James chapter one. Now it says, James, a bond servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes, which are scattered abroad. Greetings. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. Well, so someday we'll talk about this more. I'm just going to mention the fact that if you're not in faith, you can't count your trial as joy. He said, count it all joy. When you fall into various trials, if you, if you believe, if, if, if I'm not in faith that my God's bringing this out, he's bringing me through this, that my God's going to meet my needs and my God's going to take care of me. If I don't believe that, if I think this is going to be a, this is just going to be a meltdown. This is just going to be a disaster. There's no way to consider it joy. There's no joy. You can't, you don't find joy anything, anywhere in there. And so people, church people who read that and they say, count it all joy. When you fall into various trials and temptations, they just go, I don't, I don't get it. I don't understand it. Guess I'll just get high because there's no fun. There's no joy in this. And the trials, I mean, the devil doesn't leave anybody alone. There's trials for everybody. No, the way that I'm able to have joy in this time of trial is I know he's taking care of me. I know he's got a promise. I'm standing on the promise. I insist on, on rejoicing. Hello. I insist on rejoicing because I know I'm coming through this. I'm coming out of this. He's got a plan for me. He's gonna, I'm going to smell like victory, not defeat. All right, let's go on. We count it all joy. We know that, we know that faith, uh, the trial of your faith produces patience. How in the world does faith produce patience? We know, and there's another verse that says faith and patience work together. That your faith, if you're not patient, it'll hinder your faith. Because... Uh, <laughs> This is really good. I don't know if you're liking this as much as I am. This is, most of this is not in my notes. Uh, but it's fun to be led by the Holy Spirit. Okay. So, how it really works is when you stand in faith, you hardly ever get your answer immediately. There's this period of time in between saying, I believe I receive 
and actually enjoy in the manifestation of what it was that you said you believed that you received. Even when Jesus cursed the fig tree, when Jesus, you know, when, when Jesus cursed the fig tree, his disciples thought nothing happened. They thought nothing happened. Let me say it one more time because I don't want you to miss it because you could. They thought nothing happened. And the next day when they saw a wilted down fig tree, they went, ah, Oh my lands. <clears throat> so whenever you say, I believe I receive, the devil says to you, nothing happened. Come on. I know I'm talking to the right people. I know I'm saying the right thing. And he'll have, come on, the devil will have a stack. Nothing happened because you're not worthy. Nothing happened because you don't, you're not doing it right. Nothing happened because it's not God's will for you. Huh. Nothing happened because he'll have a stack of reasons for nothing happened. And that's when you fight the good fight of faith. That's when you stand there and laugh. Ha! I don't go by what I see. I don't care how it looks. I know something happened. I know it happened in the spirit. It looked like nothing happened. That's when patience. If you are impatient, say, let's just say, <laughs> let's just say, you know, Adam speaks to the tree, curses the tree. And he looks at his watch. He waits 10 minutes. Waits an hour. I'm getting a chainsaw. Hello. Hello. You know, he's got a few chainsaws. All, all sharp. Or mostly. I'll say this. One of them sharp. Now, I come to my house. I got one chainsaw. Pretty good chance. Not sharp. How, come on, that's what happens. Hello. Well, I had a problem here with my arm, you know, and so I prayed for a miracle. I waited an hour, two hours. I waited a whole day. I went to the doctor and said, cut it off. <laughs> Hello. Cut it off. I'm not, you know. No, you have to have patience. Come on, I've been there. Hello. I've been there. Stand <laughs> Starting to have a headache. Prayed. I waited 15 minutes, 20 minutes, still have a headache. I go to the aspirin. Phew. Hello, I've been there. You will, if we're not patient, we'll cut our faith off at its knees. All right. <laughs> hey, and I'm not against aspirin. I got big bottles of this stuff. I mean, uh, but I have to be careful that I don't kill my faith with my aspirin. So let's say this. And everybody doesn't have the same convictions about this. And so if I'm offending you, get over it. Because you're not supposed to be offended. If I'm saying something that you don't like to hear, then that's fine. You know, just hello. <laughs> I believe that I can pray, say, Father, I receive healing. For this, whatever's causing this headache, I, re I receive healing in Jesus' name. I'm going to take an aspirin. Because I think I may, stay, I may have to stand in faith for a little bit. And the aspirin helps me mix it easier, but my faith is really in you, which is really how we do it always when we talk about doctors. You know, uh, some faith people, when they give up, when they go to the doctor, then they totally throw away their faith in the Lord. They don't really think God's involved in this at all anymore. They say, well, for whatever reason, God didn't come through. And so, and so I'm just going to go to the doctor. Well, I believe God uses doctors. And, and I really, I think if, if you don't use your faith when you go to the doctor, you're, whoo, because doctors don't know everything. Doctors make mistakes. Hello, doctors read x-rays wrong. And, and uh, uh, um, I heard a story here just recently that, who did I hear tell this story? Some guy was in the hospital and uh, he had received his meds. And a lady came, the nurse came in to give him his meds. He said, I already had it already. And, and uh, he said, no, I already had it. And she said, no, you have to have this. And so what, that was, I talked, I, I mean, this was somebody I talked, it wasn't just a story I read. 
And uh, was it you, Kathy? Was it Gary or somebody? And so they had almost came to a fist fight. When, this, when the person in the hospital, man or woman, said, I'm not taking that. I had it already. You call the doctor. You, the doctor comes in here and tells me I have to have it. Then I'll take it. But, and so this nurse mad stomps out and then comes back in. Oh, wait, what, was it your mom? It was your mom. Yeah. And here comes the nurse. Oh, I'm sorry. And if, if she had let that nurse give her that, it would have been awful. I don't know what would have killed her necessarily, but it would have been awful. She said it would have killed her. So I'm saying, have faith in God. Even if you go to the doctor. Now, some people want to say, one of my friends got into what's one of his friends about Kenneth Hagin says, Kenneth Hagin says you can't go to the doctor. That's not true. The Lord Jesus Christ appeared to Kenneth Hagin and said, take your wife to the doctor. In a vision. Now, I mean, maybe you don't believe in Kenneth Hagin. Maybe you don't like don't believe in visions. But how I was, I was, I mean, I went to Kenneth Hagin school and I, Kenneth Hagin is my apostle of faith. Is someone, I probably have to say he's my spiritual father in a lot of ways. I'd have to say his son is my pastor. And so I, I don't worship Kenneth Hagin, but I study faith the way he understood faith. And, and, uh, and uh, he said, he could be a liar. I don't think he is. He said, the Lord Jesus appeared to him in a vision and said, I came here to tell you that I answered your prayer. Take your wife. Take your wife to the doctor and, and she'll have surgery and she'll be fine. When the doctor said she won't survive surgery, the doctor said she won't survive surgery. And so uh, Lord Jesus Christ appeared to him and said, tell her to have the surgery. She'll be okay. I'm here to answer your prayer. And the answer to his prayer was going to the doctor and having surgery. Another time, another, another time I was listening to this on the way home, I was listening to uh, Brother Hagin teach about some of this stuff. <clears throat> he was, he was uh, on the road. He was on the road uh, studying for his, and his wife was home with the kids and the Holy Spirit yanked him and said, call your wife and tell her to go to the doctor right now. And he said, well, you know, this is back when you used to, remember when you used to pay attention to what long distance cost? <laughs> remember the day when he said, I have to call after seven or I have to call after nine. And he said, well, I'll call her later. And, and the Holy Spirit said, no, call her now and tell her to go right now. Tell her to go right now. Tell her to go right now. And so he said, oh, you know what? I'll, uh, and then finally the Lord just like yelled at him. Yeah, just yelled at him and said, I said, now. And so he ran to the phone, called his wife, and he said, go now, go now, go now. And she said, well, you know, I have an appointment for later, and I don't even know. She said, I'll call him. And then when she called, this is, you know, Aretha, Mrs. Mrs. Hagen. She called the doctor, and the doctor said, well, go ahead and come in. Later, he said, if she'd have been 10 minutes later, she'd have died. Well, Kenneth Hagen's not against doctors. Not hasn't been, not now that he's in heaven, not still, not against doctors. But if you go to a doctor, and I'm happy for you to go to the doctor, then you better be believing God. Because, because uh, the doctor can only do so much. All right, so here we are. I'm going to have to hurry now, boy. Got to have patience because hardly ever does it happen immediately. Even when Jesus cursed the fig tree, it didn't happen right away. It didn't look, I mean, something happened, but you didn't see the result of it. it just, and, and so many times, other stories in the Bible, even with Jesus, Jesus, Jesus he, uh, spoke to the lepers. Uh, the lepers, you know, the lepers had to go show, their pre, show themselves to the priest, and um, the priest would sign off, somehow certify that they're healed and they can rejoin society. And so Jesus told the lepers, okay, go show yourselves to the priest. And so whenever he says that, they still look awful. They still feel terrible. I mean, I don't know what it's like to have leprosy, but they still, they don't look healed. But they got to make this trip to the priest wherever he is. And it says they were healed as they went. So they had to act like it was true. They had to demonstrate faith in what Jesus said and then received a miracle. Okay, so... That's why uh, using your faith produces patience. Verse four, but let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. So eventually you'll have what you need. If, if you don't lack anything, then that means that you trusted the Lord and he provided and you waited and he provided all your needs. Verse five, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach, 
and it will be given him. So there's a promise for wisdom. <laughs> I was going to pick on somebody from the congregation and say, there's your promise now. Like, you know, you don't have any wisdom and I'm going to be like, but I decided that's a little too mean. <laughs> and I don't have anybody in mind. I was just going to make fun of somebody. If Jennifer was here, I probably would have picked on her. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <clears throat> All right. Now look at verse six. But let him ask in faith with no doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For let, let him, uh, excuse me, verse seven. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. So I'm here. So this is the, this is this, the, you could, if you want to write a title of this, you're not, you could say this is Pastor Kim's title for his sermon. You're not going to get it. You're not going to get it. You're not going to receive it. Huh? Yeah. It's my job to tell you. This is let not that man suppose he'll receive anything. So it's my job to tell you, if you're doubting, it's my job to say, you're not going to get it. Yeah. Isn't that tough? That's tough. And Brother Hagan, I don't know. <laughs> I've been listening, brother, you know, you spend... I drove, uh, I drove 10 hours yesterday, uh, Friday night. I left after church Friday night and I drove <laughs> forever. I drove, uh, I don't know, four hours or something. I got up north of Pittsburgh and, and, uh, I thought I was going to get to Ohio. I didn't even get to Ohio and I had to go get to sleep and, uh, spent 30 minutes wandering around this little town beaver, something beaver falls or some kind of deal looking for a gas station that was open. Cause you don't think about it, you know? And, uh, that truck pull and that trailer is not quite good for 250 miles. <laughs> Finally, I got a, I got a bladder that lasts longer than my gas tank, you know, <laughs> you know, cause you always think, you know, I'll have to go to the bathroom. So I'll pull over sometime, you know, but, but I can hold it longer than that. And, I, <laughs> and, and I'm like, Oh, well, I'm gonna, You know, anyway, Let not that person suppose that he'll receive anything. So as I was saying, I, I listened to hours of Brother Hagen. Just you got to do something to entertain yourself. And it's a blessing to hear him talking. So he, I heard him telling stories about people that would, he would, he would uh, say, now what's going to happen whenever I lay hands on you? Are you going to be healed? And they'd say, well, I hope so. And he'd say, well, go sit down. You won't be. <laughs> you know, <clears throat> what, what? And then usually he, it didn't end there. Usually he'd say, you need to believe you need to be in agreement with me. You know, it doesn't happen very often that the uh, manifestation of the spirit is so strong that I, that my faith will get you healed. Even if you think it's not going to work, even, or if you're in neutral, if you think, oh, I don't know, I'm hopeful, you know, sometimes it can, you can have manifestations, gifts, of uh, the Bible talks about the gifts of special faith, the gift of special faith. Come on, when you raise the dead, he's not in agreement. I mean, he's laying there dead. He's not breathing. Okay, so usually raising the dead uh, requires a manifestation of a gift of the Spirit like that. From what, from what I understand, I've never raised anybody from the dead yet. I'll get my first one here. One of these. Hope it's not any of you. <laughs> what is the matter with you? I don't know. I I slept last night. Uh, so maybe tell Kathy, don't title this sermon. You're not going to get it, but it'd be a good title. Cause I, it's my job to tell you that you're not going to get the answer to your prayer. The things, the things that God has promised, you won't receive if you're not in faith. Boy, pastor Kim, that's mean. Well, I want you to be ready. Because I think hard times could be coming. I, I mean, I'll say this. 
They're coming for somebody because the devil just don't leave us alone. He hates us. So whatever it looks like, he's going to challenge us. You know, some doctor's going to say, there's no cure for this. You're going to get a bad report. You're going to get bad news. You're going to be, oh, my lands, the, the, the wind blew the roof off my house, and the insurance company says you're not covered for that. I mean, I don't know what it's going to be. I'm not against insurance companies, but I'm just saying you've got great and precious promises from God for all things that pertain to life and godliness. <clears throat> and it's my job to tell you that if you're not in faith, then you're not going to receive your promise. And so I want us to be ready. It doesn't matter what kind of goo the devil throws on us. We're going to be good to go because we've got a promise and our God is bigger than the devil. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> go to Hebrews chapter 3. We spent a lot of time talking about this a couple years ago, maybe several months ago. And um, again, this, is part, this comes from the story of the Israeli people, the Jewish people coming out of Egypt. That the, the, um, the Jewish people came out of Egypt, you know, they had the plagues and stuff, and the Pharaoh finally said, okay, get out of here. And they came to the Red Sea, and the, how are we going to get across the Red Sea? But Moses parted the sea, and they all went across the sea on dry ground. And then they spent several days uh, eating manna from heaven and drinking water from the rock and having miracles and stuff. And they finally got over, to, they got their Ten Commandments, and they got, <laughs> they got blessings, and they got judgments. I mean, you know, it was really quite a journey. <clears throat> but anyway, they got over there, and they sent spies into the land of their promise. God says, no, I'm giving this to you, but yeah, somebody lives there, <laughs> but I'm giving it to you. So let's, uh, let's see who lives there. And they set spies into the land and they said, oh, my lands, this is heaven. This is, this is beautiful. It's beautiful. It's everything God promised it would be. The problem of it is the people who live there don't want to just give it away. They want to fight. They got giants even. They got giants. And so the people panicked and they didn't have faith that God would make them victorious over the giants to possess the land. So here we are in Hebrews chapter three, almost to the end of the chapter. This, <laughs> this is good. You're going to go home and say, I'm never going to, that pastor, Kim, he's just like, he's being mean. I don't want to even say this. Don't turn there, but just think about this. Hebrews eleven six. 6. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. So how does God feel about not faith? He's not pleased. In fact, he's been known to say some pretty mean things. He's been known to say some pretty angry, hello, did I say angry? Well, I don't, I don't like the idea of an angry God, Pastor Kim. Well, I'm sorry, but that's what the Bible says, and I'm just not going to give up the Bible for something that you think you're not like the sound of. So here in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 17, I'm at, I'm at uh, Hebrews chapter 3, verse 17. Now, with whom was he angry 40 years? Who's he? He is God. God was angry for 40 years? We don't like that. We just want to believe in his grace and his mercy, and it doesn't really matter if you mess up. No problem, honey. They couldn't help it. They were scared. Did you hear me say scared? I was scared pitching my voice they were scared it's not their fault it's not fair for god to be mad at them because they were scared what's the matter with you meanie apparently it was fair apparently being scared was their own fault because if they'd have trusted him if they'd have been paying attention every time they saw a miracle in the hand of god 
if they didn't care about pleasing their own flesh more than pleasing God, they would have got to there and they would have been like Joshua and Caleb who said, what are you talking about? Our God is well able to make us possess the land that he promised us. We don't like him. We don't like God to be angry. We think that's not right. That's not fair. We are going to go to another church. We're going to go to a church that doesn't talk about an angry God. That's not you. It's not. <laughs> I know it's not because you're here. And it's like, it's not like we haven't met, you know. You've been hearing this kind of stuff for a while. But it's people. People who call themselves Christians. People who believe they're going to heaven. The Bible, the Bible tells us in the last days, folks are going to have itching ears. And they're going to say, if you're not going to tell me what I want to hear, I'm going somewhere else. I don't want to, I don't, I don't like the idea of God being angry. Well, that's an Old Testament thing. He wouldn't, God wouldn't be angry in the New Testament. Really? Well, then why is this Hebrews? Why is this in the New Testament? Why is Paul calling their attention to this in the New Testament? If it's not a threat, if it's not a real possibility, you think you can haunt God off? I think you can. He loves us. He loves us. I got a few spankings in my life. You know, you probably, <laughs> you know. I never got a spanking that, I never even, <laughs> I never got a spanking that wasn't from love. Seriously. Pretty sure. We should get mom and dad in here and put them on trial. <laughs> Pretty sure. I remember my dad saying, Kim, this hurts me more than it hurts you. And I thought, what's wrong with you? <laughs> It feels to me like it hurts me a lot more than you farmer hands got calluses like that. Pretty sure it hurts my little hind a lot more than it hurts you. <laughs> no, I never got a, I never got a spanking that wasn't from love. And I, I never, I only, uh, mostly, I only got one spanking I didn't deserve. Uh, and I got lots. I only got one I didn't really deserve. I mean, there was a lot of them that I deserved that I never got. But I got a spanking I didn't deserve one time. And dad had to come, he came to my bedroom. And I'm sorry, Kim, I spanked you and it wasn't your fault. And I bawled. <laughs> I bawled the worse. And my dad apologizing to me than I did when he spanked me. I never got a spanking that wasn't from love. And so, and so can, God, can God be angry at us? Can, he, can his wrath uh, and judgment come to his own people? Yeah. But it's for our benefit. Like, <laughs> I don't, don't want to get back to the sermon, but you know what he said about communion? He said, you're being judged because you're doing communion. The way you're doing communion is in selfishness and pride and, and arrogance and stuff. And you don't esteem the body of Christ. And he said, you got people who are sick and weak and dead in your church because they won't, they won't judge themselves so they wouldn't be judged. But God judges us so that we don't go to hell. You don't, want to, you don't want to have God aggravated at you. Just do what he says. Trust him. All right. <laughs> You're not going to get it. <clears throat> so here we are again. <clears throat> Excuse me. Hebrews uh, chapter 3, verse 17. Now with whom was he angry 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose corpses fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest? What that means is he said, okay, just for that, you can't go to the promised land. You're going to have to hang out in the desert till you die and your kids will go in. Only two people from that generation got to go to the promised land, Joshua and Caleb. Verse 18 again, and to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who did not obey. So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. They could not enter in because of unbelief. Now, I, I haven't completely studied every unbelief in the whole New Testament, but mostly the ones I'm finding, including this one, the Greek word translated unbelief really means not faith. 
the the very the this the pis pis or pistis part of the Greek is really what is the key and there's strong there's so you put a they put a modifier on the pistis word to make strong faith or weak faith or no faith but uh, so from what I've been able to study so far is the main thing about unbelief is that you don't believe God you don't believe the promise you believe what you see you believe the mountain you believe the giants. The giants say, yeah, you're not coming in here. And they go back, well, hey, God, they said, they said we can't come in. You believe the world, you believe what your eyes see instead of what God said. So the reason why they tromped around in the wilderness for 40 years till they're all dead is because when it came down to it, they didn't have the faith to march into the promised land and see God's hand revealed in their victory. <laughs> let's go on. Chapter 4, verse 1. We, oh, let's read verse 19 again. So we see that they, this is, this is 319. So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Now, see, what are we talking about? We're talking about James chapter 1. Let not that man suppose that he shall receive anything from the Lord because he's double-minded and unstable in all of his ways. Look at now, um, verse 1 of chapter 4. Therefore, since a promise remains of enter, entering his rest, let us fear, lest anybody seems to come short of it. We want every promise. We don't want to miss out on a single promise, right? Verse 2, for indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them, but the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. What We're going to hear in a little bit, or maybe next Sunday, depends on how far we get in this one. We, we said it this morning already, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. Some people will hear the word and not hear. Remember what Jesus said? Jesus says to him that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Some people, it goes in one, they hear it, but they don't mix faith with it. They don't accept it and receive it and connect with it. I, sometime I'm going to actually teach on that thing of hearing, but it's going to be a while. Because they didn't mix faith with it, they did not go in to the promised land. Let's keep going. For indeed, the, this is verse 2, for indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them, but the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith, in those who heard it. I'm going to read this next verse kind of quick. For we who have believed do enter that rest as he has said, so I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he has spoken in a certain place on the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day in all his works. And again in this place, they shall not enter my rest, since it remains therefore that some must enter it, and those to whom it was first preached did not enter because of disobedience. Now, this New King James uh, translated dis uh, disobedience. <clears throat> it looks, you know, the old King James said, because of unbelief. Now, and it looks to me like maybe somewhere around half of the translations say disobedience. Now, I don't, I don't want to really complain about that translation very much because there's, uh, if, I, if, I, if I tell Leon, hey, I need you to do this, he says, okay, but then he doesn't do it, that's not faithfulness. There's a connection between faith and faithfulness. And you can equip, you can, unfaithfulness can be called disobedience. If whenever, whenever God said, go into the promised land and possess the land, they said, huh, uh, there's giants there. That is, it's lack of faith. 
It's unbelief and it's also disobedience. So like revised and, and authorized and I don't mean authorized, I mean American Standard and, uh, and the New King James obviously translate that word, but it's the same word that's translated unbelief and all the other places we're going to look at. And the King James Bible says they did not enter because of unbelief. So if you're not, if you're not standing on your faith, you're not going to get it. If I'm not standing on my faith. Now he's merciful, yeah, and he'll help us. And he'll coach us up. And he'll, he'll put his, if we'll seek him and if we'll follow him, we'll, he'll cause, he'll put faith in us. In fact, that's kind of where we're headed. Let's hurry up. Oh, look at, hurrying up here. Are you okay? Okay, okay. Um, therefore, let's, uh, we looked at verse 11, didn't we? Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of unbelief. Let's, Jesus, you know, Jesus kind of said the same stuff. Look at Mark chapter 4. <clears throat> In Mark chapter 4, look at... This, uh, this is a story of, of Jesus. Um, he fell asleep in the boat and, and, and started to storm and they had to wake him up and stuff. <clears throat> and uh, so Jesus, you know, speaks peace to be still to the wind and the waves. Look at verse 40. This is Mark chapter 4, verse 40. But he said to them, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? Jesus, Jesus comments, Jesus is watching people about their faith. He'll make comments, you know, oh, this is good faith. This lady has great faith. That man has great faith. And he says, what is the matter with you that you don't have any faith? Now, I don't think Jesus asked the question because he didn't know. I think he, Jesus asked the question because he wanted them to think about it. You know, it's a fair question to ask us. Oh, Pastor Kim, that's too personal. Don't say that. But it's fair. Could Jesus look at you and say, how is it that you have no faith? How is that? How is that? In Luke 8, it's the same telling, the same story in the Gospel of Luke. He says, where is your faith? Where is your faith? Uh, Matthew 14, Peter walks on the water. Let's maybe start with verse 29. This is Matthew 14, 29. So he said, come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. Man. Verse 30. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous and he, he was afraid and beginning to sink, he cried out saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Jesus, come on. Do you think Jesus wouldn't stand right in front of your face and say, come on, why did you not trust me? Why did you doubt? Why, come on, why did you let you, why did you start looking at the wind and the waves? Why did you think that wind and waves had anything to do with walking on water? You know, it's, I, you know, now I'm just, this is my, me using my imagination, but it doesn't seem to me like walking on the water is any easier on a calm day because I know the physics. I mean, I did the problems. You know, I did the math problems about, about uh, buoyancy. You know, how in the world do you make a steel battleship, a steel battleship float? How do you do that? I mean, we studied that in college. Well, anyway, you don't care. <laughs> 
But anyway, the wind, you know, the math doesn't work out for Peter to walk on the water, calm or not calm. The issue is your faith. Think about that. Think about that. Think about that. Jesus says, this miracle, come on, we could have done a square dance out here, Peter. Come on. We could have had a foot race. Come on. But you doubt it. Do you think Jesus would look in your life? Is there anything in your life that he would look at you and he would say, why don't you believe me? I made you a promise about this. Why do you insist on looking at everything, all the reasons? The devil tells you why it can't work. The devil tells you why, all the reasons why it's impossible. Why do you believe him instead of me? Oh, come on, Jesus. Jesus is love. He loves us, doesn't he? And he is merciful. Come on, he's merciful. He went to the cross for us. He shed his blood for us, but he's called us higher. He's called us to more than where we're at. And he's given us great and precious promises to cause us to be partakers. But he's going he's to tell us. If you're double-minded, if you doubt, don't think you're going to be blessed. You're going to have to be in faith. You're going to have to be in faith or know somebody who is. There's no food at your house, but you got you, <laughs> your son-in-law. Why did I say son-in-law? I have no idea. Your son-in-law has faith and he's got food in his house. He may, he may feed you. I don't know what the future holds. I know the devil hates us. And I know matter that whatever he brings against us, God's got a plan. He's got a provision. He's given us, he's given us great and precious promises that cover all things for life and godliness. But he said, you receive those by faith. Let's keep going. I'm, I'm supposed to tell you if you're not in faith, you won't get it. Let me say this real quick because I'm afraid I'll, <clears throat> I'm not afraid. <laughs> I'm concerned I'll get, I'll get, I want, there's one thing I want to say. We already said this morning, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. And, and so a lot of times we'll say that, that, you know, this whole Bible is the word. But, you know, there are verses in the Bible that don't build your faith as much as other verses. You know, if you read that, you know, Sam begot William and William begot Sally and Sally begot, that's all true and it's all the Bible and it's all the word, but the begats don't build your faith probably the same way as hearing about God appearing to Abraham saying, if you'll trust me and walk in my ways, then here's the way I'll bless you. So that's, you know, <laughs> this is kind of not the best way to construct a logical argument. So I want to say that some particular verses are really power packed to build your faith. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word. And, and so if you'll get, I, I may defend this better later than I'm going to say it today. But if you want, if you say, Pastor Kim, Pastor Kim, what you're saying this morning is convicting me that my faith is not where, come on, because that's where I was. I was here, the, you know, a while back, and I'm still, <laughs> I said, why is my faith not where I think it should be? Because there are some issues I was dealing with, and I said, why is not my, I study faith a lot. And I felt like God said, because you're studying everything, and you're studying, but you're, you're, you're weak on these power-packed, these power-packed passages that directly build your faith. And you know what the root of it was? I could quote him. But just because I've heard it before and I've quoted it and I've even preached on it doesn't mean that I'm hearing and I'm letting that bring faith to me. So here's what I want to say. The power pack verses that build your faith stronger and faster are the promises. When you read the promise and you think about the promise, and you meditate on the promise, and you write down the promise, and then you make yourself recite it three or four times. That is the best power pact for your faith. We, we touched on this a few weeks ago a little bit. There, there are teachings about faith that teach us how to use our faith, and that's fun stuff to study. That's some of my favorite. Some of my favorite verses are about how faith works. 
But the most power-packed verses to put faith in your heart are the promises. I heard Kenneth Hagin say this. I was talking to Pastor Dave about this last week. Oh, don't let me forget to talk about uh, Pastor Dave coming to Fairbury. We talked about that and, and how that might work, look when it happens. And so I don't want to stop preaching my sermon, but don't let me forget. I, we, we need to talk about that. Should have been in the announcements and I forgot. So Kenneth Hagin, you know, uh, was raised up. He was, he was a, a paralyzed. He spent 16 months uh, in bed. And the Lord taught him, uh, the Lord taught him faith right there. He had a Bible and, and he, he le learned something about faith and was miraculously saved and healed. Okay. And so uh, as he was commissioned to preach the gospel, the Lord said to him, go teach my people faith. And so I don't, I don't know of anybody that I'd say in history that I think is outside of Jesus himself is a better teacher purely on the subject of faith than Brother Hagin. Now, the Bible has a lot to say about love and forgiveness and patience and mercy and faithfulness and character. But on the subject of faith, I, I don't know of anybody uh, better. And, and Brother Hagin's not perfect, but, but he, t he taught about faith a lot. He understood faith a lot. Uh, and so he told about whenever he faced particular challenges, he would, he said, I would, I would spend a couple of hours in the night not releasing my faith yet. I haven't said it yet. I'd be, I'd be reading those power pack verses. I'd be reading those verses of the promises. And then I'd meditate on him and pray and fall asleep. And I sleep two hours and then I wake up again and read those verses again and meditate on those verses and pray for a couple hours and then fall asleep. So two hours awake, meditate on the verses, two hours of sleep all night. He said, I did that a lot. One and two nights. He said only one time, one time I did that three nights in a row. But he said after two nights of that pray, sleep, pray, sleep, you know, then I said, I spoke it and I said, I believe I receive in Jesus name. So what, so what's the deal? So he knows how faith works. He knows you have to believe that you receive before you have it. He knows that you have to speak it out. He knows that you have to walk like it's true. You have to act like it's true. He knows that you have, he knows how faith works, but his assessment of his situation was, I'm not sure my faith is ready for that. I'm going to build my faith. I'm going to encourage my faith. And so, so re the promises that exactly promise you what, you what you're facing, those promises are the most power-packed at putting faith in you. Okay. I wanted to be sure I said that. We'll probably come back to that uh, two or three times in the course of studying this because I don't want to get away from that idea. Uh, reading, reading verses about love are good. And, and I, I wouldn't, I'm not despising those even, not even a little. But if you're in a fight for your life and you're trying to build your faith and Jesus comes along and says, how is it, how is it you have, what happened to your faith? Where's your faith? How is it you have no faith? Well, I got reading this, you know, new novel and I haven't been studying my faith verses. I know, I know a lot of preachers who will say before I, my head does not hit the pillow any night that I haven't read my faith verses. My verses about healing scriptures, not even sick, but I don't go to bed until no matter how late it is, how tired I am. I don't know. It's not me. I mean, I'll, my head will hit the pillow and I'll be out. But, but I, you know what I'm saying? Study in the promise, meditate on the promise is the fastest way of putting faith in your heart. Okay. Okay. So now let's go on. Um, <clears throat> what do we said? We said, we're saying that it, uh, let not that man suppose he'll receive anything from the Lord. Well, we don't want to do that. Let's uh, look at Matthew 17. This happens, Matthew 17 happens right after the Mount of Transfiguration. You think about, <laughs> well, it's gone. So they're coming down, you know, Peter, James, and John were with Jesus on the mountain, right? And he had three. And uh, they come down the mountain and they find that this guy with this, he has an epileptic kid or some, his kid has some kind of an issue. It's demonic, really. And the, and the disciples t tried to cast him out and, and uh, they didn't have success. And so Jesus comes along and cast, cast this devil out of this kid. 
And so what happened is the kid would have fits. Like we might say seizures, but I don't even know if it, I mean, I wasn't there. I didn't see it. But the guy says, since he was little, the devil would try to kill him. He'll, he, if he'd be by the water, the devil would, this fit would hit him and he'd fall in the water because the devil wants to kill him, right? Or he'd be next to the fire and then he'd, the devil would hit him and he'd have this. And so uh, Jesus cast the devil out of him and he had another fit. But it didn't wig Jesus out. And so what I think happened, we can make, I can make a better case than I'm giving you for this. That the disciples, they've been casting out devils for a long time. They, Jesus, since Luke chapter 10, Jesus has sent them out. And he said, heal the sick, cast out devils. So they, this is not their first devil. Remember, they came back. They said, Jesus, hey, the devils, man, they come right out. So they've been casting out devils for a while. But check that this goes back to what our very, our very beginning of our sermon today. So the, so the disciples tried to cast the devil out of that kid. And he had a fit, and the devil spoke to them and said, it's not working. Nothing happened. And they believed what they saw and said, ah, nothing happened. Why couldn't we cast them out? What happened? And the fact is, Jesus didn't wig out. Jesus didn't say, say oh, why isn't this working? He's got to come out. Jesus, Jesus has the authority to cast out devils, not just the power, but the authority, which we talked about that previous. We'll have to talk about that some more. So in the context of that, they said, how come it didn't work for us? Jesus down in, uh, Oh yeah. 17 verse, uh, 18. Now, in the Matthew, in Matthew's telling of this, Matthew doesn't tell us that the kid had another fit. But one of the other Gospels tells us the kid had another fit. Okay, let's start with verse 17. This is Matthew 17, 17. Then Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation. Jesus cares about faithlessness. You know what Jesus would say? Jesus would say, if you believe what you saw more than what the Bible says, you're a pervert. You're perverse. You believe what you see more than what the Bible says? The promise of Almighty God, creator of the universe? Verse 17, Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked the demon and it came out of him and the child was cured from that very hour. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, why could we not cast it out? So Jesus said to them, because of your unbelief. They didn't believe it. Now, you want to say, oh, 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 hold on, Jesus. How can you tell them that they didn't have any faith? How come you want to blame their unbelief? Because this is not their first rodeo. They've cast out lots of devils. Something about this one, when he didn't go easy, when there was a faith and patience, they cast away their confidence. And so Jesus makes a comment about that. We're going to probably have to end after this, though I kind of wanted to, I got way more to say here. Verse 20, I'm in Matthew 17, 20. So Jesus said to them, because of your unbelief, for assuredly I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you'll say to this mountain, move from here and it will move and nothing will be impossible for you. However, this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. So now there have been people who said, well, there's a certain kind of devil that you have to have a special technique. You have to do it. You have to do it a certain way with prayer and fasting. But that's not, I don't think that's what Jesus is saying here. Because he gave them the straight up answer. He gave him the straight up answer that 
you couldn't cast them out because of your unbelief. He didn't say it's because he said the wrong words. Well, then, so why does Jesus bring up the prayer and fasting thing? Well, I think Jesus is telling us prayer and fasting helps us with our unbelief. If we spend time with the Lord giving up other stuff, let go of the TV, let go of the pizza, and focus on him and listening to him, and you know, you know what I'm talking about, right? I mean, you guys, this is not a ritual. This is not like, well, well, uh, I'm fasting today, so instead of eating, I'm going to change the oil in the lawnmower. No, 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 no. No, the purpose of fasting is to meet with the Lord and hear from heaven and, and focus on him. And so there's something about these times of prayer and fasting that when the devil looks stubborn, yeah, you're okay. Yeah, I'm not freaked out. I mean, uh, okay, let me tell, remember the story Harbison tells? I'll tell a story on somebody else instead of Brother Hagen. <clears throat> uh, in fact, if you watch the online services, he mentioned this just briefly in the services. Um, but remember, he, he uh, uh, I think he was in Texas, and uh, this cab driver driving past the tent, uh, the Holy Ghost spoke to him and said, said, if you go to that tent meeting, that preacher will cast the devil out of you. Because this guy, this guy, he knew he had a devil, and he, he went all over America to the big-time famous preachers, and, and none of them cast the devil out of them. And, and by the way, that's not really an indictment on them. Uh, it's, it sounds like it might be, but it's not. And I don't want to go into why it's not, but it's just not. But the Lord said to him, you go in here, he'll cast the devil out of you. And he was a great big guy. Remember that? He was, I think uh, he was a great big, big guy. And uh, I think his name was Segu, uh, Seguzman is the name of the guy. And so uh, the, uh, I think he was African and he had a butterfly God inside of a demon kind of thing, you know? And so, and so uh, Dave said, yeah, he, he knew it was going to be one of those. And the kind of that prayer and fasting is a good idea. And so he let everybody else leave, dismissed the whole tent and, and that guy stayed. And then he cast the devil out of him. And, the, and, the, and this guy, wow, he like ripped his shirt off and he slithers around on the floor like a snake and screams and cries and puts on quite a show. And Dave, so here's Dave's tell. Dave says, I, Dave said, I, just, I sat there on the platform. He said, I didn't raise my voice. I said, this is not a very good Harbison imitation, by the way. He said, devil, I'm not impressed. He didn't try to grab him, handcuff him, wrestle him. He didn't scream. It wasn't about his technique. So, you know, if you get into devils, you know, people are get into that. Read books about it. They get into their techniques and you got to have certain candles and got to play this song. And yeah, I mean, there's people get totally weird, but you don't have to be weird to cast out the devil. You just got to have faith. You got to understand who you are in Christ and the authority that we have in Jesus' name. And he said, finally, after all that, I think mean, the guy puked and messed his pants. I mean, I don't know why. The guy made a mess. They had to clean the carpet when, there were, when the guy was done. But he was free. He was delivered. Hallelujah. You got to believe. By faith and patience, we inherit the promises. You're going to need it. I don't know what's coming. I don't know the future, but I know the devil's going to attack. If he's not already, if you're not already in the middle of a fight, I, I know that one's coming because he doesn't leave any of us alone. And according to the Bible, in the end times, he ramps it up because he knows his time is short. And I'm telling you that you need to stand on the promise. You need to be familiar with the promises. You, know, you don't need to be calling somebody saying, is there a promise for, you know what I'm saying? You should know. There, uh, there's books, there's books of verses, promises about this. I used to have a bunch of them. I would give them away, uh, 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 Bible promises, all the promises in the book. Um, Kenneth Hagin has a book, uh, healing verses, healing promises. You can buy, you can see here YouTubes or buy, buy uh, CDs of people just reading the promises to you. Rick was telling me that Carrie, Carrie has a CD of, of somebody just reading healing promises. 
Just read it. And it says, sometimes it seems like she'll put that thing and she wants to hear it over and over for a while. I'm guessing maybe she's trying to build her faith for something that maybe, you know, I, don't, I didn't really, you know, question her about it. If you're not in faith, if I'm not in faith, Jesus says, let not that person think that they'll receive anything from God. God's not, he's not impressed by games that we play. Well, I'll get a whole new wardrobe of clothes and I'll wear bright, shiny, new clothes, fancy clothes to church and everybody will know how spiritual I am. You know what? He's not, he's not fooled. He's not into playing games. It's not even how long you pray. You might say, well, I prayed 30 hours this week. He's, he's not, and I'm not saying it's not good to pray 30 hours. I mean, I'm, yay, I probably should do that. I heard about a guy, the Lord challenged him. He needed to pray five hours a day. Five hours a day. Whoo. But the change it made in him and his church was just, you just would almost wouldn't believe the story if you heard the story. I, I want you to be ready. I want you to have faith in the promise. I want you to have patience for when you speak. We'll talk about this some more. I know we got to quit. I want, you to, I want you to study the promises. Dig around. If you've got to buy a book, if you, if you need to, if you need to uh, do a Google search or whatever, find, they find the promises in the area. Uh, uh, there's promises about finances. Come on. There's promises about healing. There's promise, we read in James chapter 1, a promise for wisdom. If any man lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives liberty. There's promises, uh, according to Peter, the, uh, the great and precious promises will cause us to be partakers of the divine nature and provide all the things we need for life and godliness. You, we need to be students of those promises. We need to never get happy with the fact that we think we learned it. We need to always be hearing. Faith comes by hearing and hearing and hearing, we sometimes say. Let's pray. God, we love you so much. You're so good. We're so grateful that your Holy Spirit has been here just like you promised. <clears throat> and we've, we've heard some of this stuff uh, in an absolutely new way. It's almost like a new challenge for us. <sighs> we want to be ready. We want to be ready for any test, any trial. We don't want to flunk any of them. We want, we want to follow your will, God. We want to go, go where you send us and do what you tell us and, and say the things that you put in our hearts to say. It may, really, it may require some serious faith, and so we want to be ready for that. Huh. So here's what the Lord's telling me. <clears throat> Your flesh will fight you on this. It's amazing. It's amazing that you can be in pain and your flesh fight you against believing the healing promises. It's, I don't really know that I understand it all together, but the Lord, I feel like the Lord is telling me that there's a bunch of, uh, maybe lots, I don't, of, of Christendom who make a choice against faith. Because your flesh does fight you on it. And they'd rather give in to the flesh than fight the good fight of faith it's easier it's maybe you know it, it hurts more i mean it, it, to, to walk in poverty or or uh, uh, ignorance or or a sickness but it's easier on your flesh in the manner of speaking And the devil, the devil will try that trick here. We'll have to pray that he's not successful.
It's, it's too easy for people to think, I don't need the promise. I'm, I'm, I'll be okay. I have enough. I'm okay. I'll be, I'll be fine. I got a good doctor and I, and, uh, you know, I got a good pension and I, or, uh, you know, I uh, inherited some money or what I won the lottery or whatever. I'm okay. I don't really need, I don't really need the promise. And uh, that's not okay. That's not what he's called us to. That's not what makes him happy. We please him. Come on, we please him. When we use our faith and stand on our faith and we receive the things that he's purchased, we walk in the promises that he's established, the provision he's already made just tickles him. He just loves it. He just loves it when we ask him for stuff. When we, when we call out the promise and say, here, Lord, here's the promise that you made me. I'll take that. I, I'll accept it. I'll walk in that. that. He paid a horrible price to offer that promise. Nothing makes him happier than people to receive that. That's how we get saved. It's the same kind of joy. Heaven rejoices when a sinner gets saved. Heaven rejoices when people walk in the promises. Well, God, there's been uh, this uh, this morning you've uh, you've uh, blessed us and you've encouraged us. In a little bit, we feel rebuked, chastised, even for not being more faithful to build up our our confidence and our faith in the promises that you've made. Even some things that we've prayed for, we didn't bother to get faith for. We just hoped you'd do it. But we make a commitment to you today that, that we'll walk in the light that you've, you've shown us, that we will be doers of your word. Hallelujah. 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 Father, we know that we didn't get all the way, uh, we didn't get all the way we needed to go on this. We're going to have to study this some more. And that even as we leave this place this morning, We don't, leave your, we don't leave you here. We don't leave your spirit here. And we, we want this message, we want these verses to kind of still linger in us. We want to meditate on these things. We want to be in, uh, have a focus in our hearts of building our faith so that we are ready. And we pass the test. We succeed and we walk in the promises for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, now we're going to want to talk about for a second. It looks to me like that Harbison's. Did you get, were you ready for me? Look at you. Okay. It'll be the last week of September into the first week of October before Harbison's can get here, which gets us past the most fun tent weather. Usually by the end of September, early October, sometimes it's in the 50s. Or four, well, we had some 50s this past week at night. And so it would probably be an indoor meeting. And, and it's, this is not set in stone, but this, I'd say we're at a 90, 91% likelihood this is how this is going to work. So the last week of September, which goes into day one or two of October, something I forget how, I remember how that calendar looks. That's when Harbison's can come. And... Um, also, and then the Belleville Tent Revival starts the Sunday night of Labor Day weekend, which means it conflicts with the Durants being in El Paso. Uh, you know, Kevin and Annie were here, and so they're going to be do a weekend over in El Paso. Have you got, does anybody not know about that? We should make that, in, oh, it's in our announcement, it's in the bulletin. If we had a bulletin today, we would see it, yeah. Uh, so, um, so we don't have very much of August left. And then the Belleville meeting starts 
I think it's like the 5th or 6th of, of September, which is the Labor Day weekend thing. So I'll probably head down there for that. Uh, I have an idea it's going to go two weeks. It's just in my heart, they didn't say that. So if that's the case, then I'll come home for Sunday church. I'll probably come home on Friday night and then probably head back down there to help with that. And then that gets to the middle of September, if, they go, if that meeting goes two weeks, that gets to the middle of September. So it'd be the last week of September before they could come back up here. And so we'll, so, so it looks like, like I said, 90% chance it's going to be that last week of October that, that sneaks into September, that sneaks into October. And, it, and it'll be an indoor, meaning not pitching the tent. So, and, uh, and then Scott, Pastor Scott in El Paso says, we want you back. This year, like, you know, we were just there. When was that? Was it May? It was, it was late spring or early. No, wait, 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 we were still in lockdown. So it might've been June or something. But anyway, Scott says, we want you to come back this year. The effect, he said, the effect of, of those meetings on our congregation were so outstanding. We want you back this year. And part of what Dave's been teaching on, he started, if you were, it heard the El Paso meetings, it's a it, prayer and the authority and the necessity for us to pray for the upcoming elections, elections and in to the future, which I think is righteous. I mean, I think that's exactly God. <clears throat> and so, uh, which means we wouldn't go to, you know, there's still a chance of going to Mississippi. But even in Mississippi, November's kind of late to be doing meetings if we are trying to do a tent meeting. So uh, I know that, that he wants to go back to Claude and Mary Blankenship's church in Mississippi, and they haven't talked to Mary's son, John, yet about going to Hattiesburg, so I don't know. So no, that's kind of what it looks like, and I don't know, you know, for some reason, I, well, we'll just see how it goes, but that's kind of the schedule of things, so you kind of have it in the back of your mind that, well, how, so be sure that you don't plan your vacation whenever we're going to be, <laughs> okay, God bless you, <laughs> you're dismissed. <laughs> don't you Thank you for joining us. If you don't have a church that you can be ministered to on a regular basis, we invite you here to Faith Fellowship Ministries. We are located at 801 North 1st Street in Fairbury, Illinois. Service times are Sunday at 10 a.m. and Wednesdays at 7 p.m. And if you're in the local area, we invite you to Word Up with WJHV 95.1 FM. We're on the air 24-7. WJHV is an outreach ministry of Faith Fellowship Ministries. And for your digital giving, load up Cash App on your mobile device. Send the pay to Faith Fellowship to cash tag dollar sign WJHV. And as always, come as you are and leave changed. We hope you enjoyed this broadcast and we hope to see you again right here on Facebook or in person. Until then, have a blessed and wonderful day.